This is Isabella E. again, and this is going to be part two of our silk banner making video. Uh, I am outside in my garage now. All my kind of workspace stuff is behind me. Um, I would suggest doing this in clothes that you don't care about getting dye all over. And also consider kind of the area where you're going to be working. Uh, if you're working on like a light colored linoleum, the dye can actually dye your linoleum. Uh, so. I would suggest doing this in a place where cleanup is going to be easy. If you do get dye on the floor, you know, clean it up immediately because it can stain everything. Uh, I also, I don't dilute any of the dyes that I use so that you get the brightest color possible. So, you know, working in like your garage or something is always kind of your best bet. So as you can see, right now I have my frame out and it's set up for a six foot size banner. Uh, I have two different kinds, and I'll kind of come over there and get the camera and show you uh, what I've used before and what I've uh, used, what I'm using right now. At the moment, I'm using a banner that's made of PVC, and it's cut in two foot lengths, and I also have some one foot lengths, and uh, that allows me to go ahead and adjust the size to suit whatever I'm working on and I can do kind of funky sizes that way. Um, in the past I've also used a wooden frame that's bolted together. Here's one of the pieces. I bolted it together at the corners and uh, then I just kind of used the tension of the silk to hold the frame together. I also used to bolt it together to keep it nice and tight but I, uh, I got kind of lazy and I got tired of having to bolt things together, so I went with the PVC frame instead. The only problem with it is kind of the bigger you get, um, the more flexible the PVC is and it has a tendency to kind of squish together in the middle. It just requires a little bit of adjustment. Uh, I've also thought about maybe using wooden dowel and all kinds of different stuff. So you can build your frame out of pretty much whatever. I don't like anything really that sophisticated because I can break this down and travel with it pretty easily. So, and what holds the silk on, on mine, are binder clips and rubber bands. The advantage to these is that they're cheap and easy to replace. So it's just a pair of rubber bands and you loop it around the frame and then kind of clip it together and hold the silk together with it, which I will show you in more detail here in a minute. You can use as many clips or as few clips as you really want to, but I find kind of a good even spacing of about six inches apart or so gives me uh, good tension without having to sit there and put a million of these things on there. And your rubber bands break, especially it's dry here, so I go through a lot of them, but you, luckily they're cheap and you can buy big bags of them for a couple bucks. You also want to try to have an, a fairly equal number of clips on either side of the frame so that you're putting an equal tension on each side. That just makes it easier to uh, put straight lines on the silk. But I have also found though that it's just really difficult to get things to be 100% straight anyway, no matter how we prepare. So I just try to make everything as straight as possible and I don't worry about it that much.
Okay, as you can see, the silk is now all stretched onto the frame, all the way down. The section at the hoist down there is the one that I think is most important to have the edge at like a 90 degree angle um, because it's going to run along the pole and that's kind of the whole basis for how you're going to judge your straight lines to be and uh, if you, especially if you have any crosses or anything like that uh, you're going to want to kind of base all of your lines off of that. So I, know, I don't know if um, all of the setting up of the frame made much sense. I'm, I'm, I fast forwarded it because it takes a few minutes, but uh, if you have any questions I can clarify them in the comments section. So, the first thing that we're going to do before we do anything else is apply the resist to the silk and let it dry so that there's basically a little barrier around all the areas that we're going to dye. Uh, that will, that the dye will expand up to those little barriers and then that's how you get the separation of your colors. So the applicators that I use are the simple ones that are real on Dharma Trading Company. Um, I am bad with tools and I abuse them and leave them out to dry with paint in them and all kinds of stuff. So I don't really buy expensive stuff because I know I'm probably just going to ruin it anyway. The other thing is that uh, if you buy the water-based resist, I would suggest putting it in a different container. The cap that's on the one that the resist comes in gets all gunked up really easily and I don't like it. It's also really difficult to pour from. So I actually took a, an empty set of silk black paint bottle and put mine in there. Uh, the other thing I've noticed with the water-based resist is that I usually need to water it down a little bit when I get it. Um, it's a little bit too thick and it doesn't want to come out of the applicator bottles really easily. So I add just a little bit of water to get it flowing a little bit better. It reminds me kind of of a puff paint, except it's not really super puffy. So that's the kind of consistency that you get. The other thing I notice is that if you try to apply this stuff to a surface that's already dyed, the resist will peel off of the dyed surface because it doesn't get quite enough penetration into the fabric. So that's one of the reasons why if you're going to put resist on, do it first uh, and don't try to go back and add details and stuff with it later. Um, you could probably actually just use like a regular uh, fabric paint if you wanted to go add lines after the fact. So I would just make sure that whatever details you're going to put in, you put in before you start putting color on. This stuff also comes in several different metallic colors. It's one of the reasons why I like it. The gold and the silver are really cool. So a lot of times I'll use the silver to put details in a charge that's black so that you actually get a really good separation and it's easier to work the details in than outlining all the little detailed spots and filling them in with white dye. The silver looks really cool. It stands out really well. I've got um, some pictures up in my gallery of some banners that I've done with the silver with details. and. I'll uh, post those links later too. All right, the thing that you that makes the water-based stuff different than the rubber is the water-based. I actually make contact with the tip of the applicator on the fabric itself. With the rubber, it actually has a consistency, kind of like Elmer's glue, and you can sit there and sort of draw about an inch above the surface of the fabric and. Um, because it's rubbery, it sort of stays connected to the bottle. I don't know if that makes any sense, but uh, this stuff does not. It's more watery. It comes out uh, with less of a glue-like consistency, so you need to make sure that you're not too far up above the fabric. The other thing about this stuff is that uh, if there's air inside the bottle, it'll spit little, little bubbles and dots out a lot easier, so it's a little bit messier, so you just need to be a little bit more careful with it. I really like the rubber stuff, but I was doing it inside my house in a small area and uh, it was making me high and bugging everyone in the house. So I switched to this stuff and I just have kind of kept with it because I haven't had any problems with it 
um, as far as the banners that I made a few years ago uh, where the rubber stuff was just for whatever reason losing its consistency. The other thing that we're going to do with this is we're going to outline the entire outside of the banner except the hoist section. I'm going to leave the pre-hemmed part on the hoist so I won't use this to outline it. Uh, but all of the edges that are going to be uh, exposed to the wind, I'm going to put like an extra thick line on. What I'll do is I'll lay the line down first and then go over it with a Q-tip or a paintbrush to widen it out a little bit so that when we, when we cut it out with scissors, that's what's going to form our hem and that's what's going to protect our edges and keep it from fraying. Other than that, you pretty much just outline everything that you're working on. You don't have to worry too much about air bubbles or anything, but you need to make sure that your line is probably um, like a sixteenth of an inch thick. It needs to be thick enough to where if you if you come close to it with the paintbrush that the colors aren't going to jump from one side to the other. So I always start with the top edge a little bit here and then work from left to right. All right, when you get to a part that has a split tail, look down there. The part where the tail splits, the strongest thing that you're going to be able to do is uh, fill it in with a lot of the resist, and then when we go to cut it out, we're going to cut it out on a curve. If you cut it out on a sharp angle, then it's going to uh, risk the silk ripping in stronger winds um, or just from handling. You know, it's, it's like any piece of fabric, you know, when you, when you go to pull on it, it can rip down, um, right down the, I don't know, maybe the grain, whatever it's called. The, I don't really know all that much about fabric. So what I do is make sure that I fill it in really good so that I can cut it. A curve because I didn't used to do that and there was a few that that uh, ended up ripping a little bit you know and it didn't really occur to me at the time that that would be important to do so I kind of started changing the way that I did them a while ago
The other thing that I think is important to note is that in addition to sort of reinforcing the split on like a swallowtail like this, where any time you have a split tail with uh, sharp edges on it too, I actually reinforce the tip of the swallowtail really well too because of the fact that while it's whipping in the wind, the ends can start to fray, so I always make sure that there's a good probably half inch of resist on the end to keep it from fraying. That is it for part two. We're going to let this dry and then I'll come back and we'll start colors, which will be part three.